Good morning. It is 30 minutes past 7 in the morning and you are listening to Motivation series on Moin Udinso at Facebook and YouTube. I'm going to read a book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It is a wonderful book and I believe it will motivate you to accumulate anything rich in your life. Please listen patiently and if you like then please do share it as well. You can listen to this podcast on my Facebook page or on my YouTube channel Moinu Denso. Please do like and subscribe my channel. I might not be able to read the full chapter in one sitting but will come to you for 30 minutes to 45 minutes every day and will continue the other day. So uh, yesterday uh, what I was doing was I I read the, the chapter Power of Thought. So I had stopped in the middle, so I will continue now. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because when Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the master of our fate, the captains of our souls because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the ether in which the little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is a form of energy moving at an inconceivably high rate of vibration, and that the ether is filled from with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds. The influences and influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know why it is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us with great emphasis that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts, that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty, just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us too that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds and by means with which no man is familiar. These magnets attract towards the forces, the people, the circumstances of life which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that before we can accumulate riches in, a great, subst- in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But being a poet and not a philosopher, Henley contended himself by stating a great truth in poetic form leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little, the truth has unfolded itself, until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles, maintain a spirit of open-mindedness and remember, as you read, they are the invention of no one man. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than 500 men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts, men who began in poverty but with little education, without influence. The principles worked for these men. You can put them to work for your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard, to do. Before you read the next chapter, I want you to know that it conveys factual information which might easily change your entire financial destiny, as it has so definitely brought changes of stupendous proportions to two people described. I want you to know also that the relationship between these two men and myself is that it says that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, even if I had wished to do so. One of them has been my closest personal friend for almost 25 years. The other is my own son. The unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredited to the principle described in the next chapter, 
more than justifies this personal reference as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Almost 15 years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College, Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized the principle described in the next chapter with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appropriated it and made it a part of his own philosophy. The young man is now a member of Congress and an important factor in the present administration. Just before this book went to the publisher, he wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter. That I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress having given me an insight into the problem of men and women, I'm writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I might state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean, will mean several years of labor and responsibility for you. But I am inheartened to make this suggestion, because I know your great love for rendering useful service. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College, when I was a member of the graduating class. In that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state and will be responsible in a very large measure for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College and in that way you give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your many years of experience in association with the men who, by their greatness, have made America the richest nation on earth. I recall as though it were yesterday, the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year, and within the next few years, every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do, to get started in life. You can tell them because you have helped to solve the problems of so many, many people. If there is any possible way that you can afford to render so great a service, may I offer the suggestion that you include with every book one of your personal analysis charts in order that the purchaser of the book may have the benefit of a complete self-inventory indicating, as you indicated to me years ago, exactly what is standing in the way of success. Such a service as this, providing the readers of your book with a complete, unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues would mean to them the difference between success and failure. The service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback because of the depression, and I speak from personal experience when I say, I know these honest people would welcome the opportunity to tell you the problems and to receive your suggestions for the solution. You know, the problems of those who face the necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money. People who must start at scratch without finances and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that conies from the press, personally autographed by you, with best wishes, believe me, cordially yes, Jennings Randolph. So yeah, that's the end of the chapter 1. So I'm going to start chapter 2, and the chapter 2 says, Desire. The starting point of all achievement, the first step towards riches. When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down from the freight train in Orange, N.J., more than 30 years ago, 
he may have resembled a triumph, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas A. Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out the one consuming obsession of his life. A burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a keen, pulsating desire which transcended everything else. It was definite. The desire was not new when he approached Edition. It had been Barnes' dominating desire for a long time. In the beginning, when the desire first appeared in his mind, it may have been probably was only a wish, but it was no merry wish when he appeared before Edition with it. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edition in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edition. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Today, People who know Barnes envy him because of the break life yielded him. They see him in the days of his triumph without taking the trouble to investigate the cause of his success. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort, everything back of that goal. He did not become the partner of Edition the day he arrived. He was content to start in the most menial walk, as long as it provided an opportunity to take even one step toward his cherished goal. Five years passed because before the ch before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. During all those years, not one ray of hope, not one promise of attainment of his desire had been held out to, out to him. To everyone except himself, he appeared only another cog in the edition business well, but in his mind, he was the partner of edition every minute of the time, from the very day that he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal, because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edition, more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, but he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life and finally a fact. When he went to Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edition to give me a job of some soft. He said, I will see Edition and put him on notice that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will work there for a few months and if I get no encouragement, I will quit and get a job somewhere else. He did say, I will start anywhere, I will do anything Edition tells me to do, but before I am through, I will be his associate. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity, in case I fail to get what I want in the Edition organization. He said, there is but one thing in this world, and that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas A. Edition. I will burn all bridges behind me and stick my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. That is all there is to the barn story of success. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these souls alive unless we win. We now have no choice, we win or we perish. And they won. Every person who wins in an undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. 
only by so down doing uh, can one be sure of under maintaining the state of mind known as a bonic desire to win, essential to success. The morning after the Great Chicago Fire, a group of merchants stood on state street looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide if they would try to rebuild or leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They reached a decision all except want to leave Chicago. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, Gentlemen, on that very spot I will build the world's greatest store, no matter how many times it may burn down. That was more than 50 years ago. The store was built. It stands there today, a towering monument to the power of the of the state of mind known as a burning desire. The easy thing for Marcel Field to ha to have done would have been exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marcel Field and the other merchants because it is the same difference which distinguishes Edwin C. Barnes from thousands of all the young men who have worked in the edition organization. It is the same difference which distinguishes practically all who succeed from those who fail. Every human being who reaches the age of understanding of the purpose of money wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence which does not recognize failure will bring riches. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. These uh, first, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It, may not, it is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. First, be definite as to the amount. <clears throat> there is a psychological reason for definiteness, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, Establish a definite date when you intend to purchase the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once whether you are ready or not to put this plan into action. Fifth, write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire. Name the time limit for its acquisition, state what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your rewritten statement aloud twice daily, once just before retiring at night and once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions described in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth paragraph. You may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a bonic desire will come to your aid. If you, if you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. Only those who become money conscious ever accumulate great riches. Money consciousness means that the mind has become so thoroughly saturated with the desire for money. The one can see oneself already in possession of it. To the uninitiated who has not been schooled in the walking principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six steps to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, 
To make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than $100 million. It may be a further help to know that the six steps you recommend were carefully scrutinized by the late Thomas A. Edison, who placed his stamp, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but necessary for the attainment of an indefinite goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or credulous. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful application of these six steps does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantities unless you can walk yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. You may as well know also that every great leader from the dawn of civilization down to the present was a dreamer. Christianity is the greatest potential power in the world today because its founder was an intense dreamer who had the vision and imagination to see realities in their mental and spiritual form before they had been transmuted into physical form. If you do not see great riches in your imagination, you will never see them in your bank balance. Never in the history of America has there been so great an opportunity for practical dreamers as now exists. The six-year economic collapse had re has reduced all men substantially to the same level. A new race is about to be run. The stakes represent huge fortunes which will be accumulated within the next 10 years. The rules of the race have changed because we now live in a changed world that definitely favors the masses, those who had but little or no opportunity to win under the conditions existing during the depression when fear paralyzed growth and development. We who are in the race for riches should be encouraged to know that this changed world in which we live is demanding new ideas, new ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, new methods of teaching, new methods of marketing, new books, new literature, new features for the radio, new ideas for moving pictures. Back of all this demand for new and better things, Back of all this demand for new and better things, there is one quality which one must possess to win, and that is the finiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what one wants and the burning desire to possess it. The business depression marked the death of one age and the birth of another. This changed world requires practical dreamers who can and will put their dreams into action. The practical dreamers have always been and always will be the pattern makers of civilization. We who, we who desire to accumulate riches should remember the real leaders of the world always have been men who harnessed and put into practical use the intangible unseen forces of unborn opportunity and have converted those forces or impulses of thought into skyscrapers, cities, factories, airplanes, automobiles and every form of convenience that makes life more pleasant. Tolerance and an open mind are practical necessities of the dreamer of today. Those who are afraid of new ideas are doomed before they start. Never has there been a time more favorable to pioneers than the present. True, there is no wild and woolly west to be conquered as in the days of the covered wagon. But there is a vast business, financial and industrial world to be remolded and redirected along new and better lines. In planning to acquire your set of the riches, let no one influence you to scorn the dreamer. To win the big stakes in the changed world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers of the past, 
whose dreams have given to civilization all that it has of value. The spirit which serves as the lifeblood of our own country, your opportunity and mine to develop and market our talents. Let us not forget, Columbus dreamed of an unknown world, staked his life on the existence of such a world and discovered it. Copernicus, the great astronomer, dreamed of a multiplicity of worlds and revealed them. No one denounced him as impractical after he had triumphed. Instead, the world worshipped at his shrine, thus proving once more that success requires no apologies, failure permits no alibis. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across and never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat, for they perhaps do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage, went to walk with what tools he possessed without waiting for opportunity to favor him, and now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He has put more wills into operation than any man who ever lived, because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be co that could be operated by electricity, began where he stood to put his dream into action, and despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by the dream until he made it a physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Willand dreamed of a chain of cigar stores, transformed his dream into action, and now the United Cigar Stores occupy the best corners in America. Lincoln dreamed of um, see, Lincoln dreamed of freedom for the black slaves, put his dream into action, and barely missed living to see a united North and South translate his dream into reality. The Wright brothers dreamed of a machine that would fly through the air. Now, one may see evidence all over the world that they dreamed soundly. Marconi dreamed of a system for harnessing the intangible forces of the ether. Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every wireless and radio in the world. Moreover, Marconi's dream brought the humblest cabin and the most stately manor house side by side. It made the people of every nation on earth backdoor neighbors. It gave the President of the United States a medium by which he may talk to all the people of America at one time. And on short notice, it may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a psychopathic hospital when he announced he had discovered a principle through which he could send messages through the air without the aid of wires or other direct physical means of communication. The dreamers of today fare better. The world has become accustomed to new discoveries, nay, it has shown a willingness to reward the dreamers who gives the world a new idea. The greatest achievement was, at first and for a time, but a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stares. Dreams are the settlings of reality. Awake, arise and assert yourself. You dreamers of the world, your star is now in the ascendancy. The world depression brought the opportunity you have been waiting for. It taught people humility, tolerance, and open-mindedness. The world is filled with abundance of opportunity, which the dreamers of the past never knew. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. The world no longer scoffs at the dreamers, nor calls him impractical. If you think it does, Take a trip to Tennessee and witness what a dreamer president has done in the way of harnessing and using the great water power of America. A score of years ago, such a dream would have seemed like madness. You have been disappointed, you have undergone defeat during the depression, you have felt the great heart within you crushed until it bled. Take courage for these experiences have tempered the spiritual mental of which you are made, they are assets of incomparable value. Remember, too, that all who succeed in life get off to a bad start, 
and pass through many heartbreaking struggles before they arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at the moment of some crisis which they are introduced to their other selves. John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, which is among the finest of all English literature, after he had been confined in prison and sorely punished because of his views on the subject of religion. O. Henry discovered the genius which slept within his brain after he had met with great misfortune and was confined in a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio, being forced through misfortune to become acquainted with his other self and to use his imagination. He discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. Strange and varied are the ways of life, and stranger still are the ways of infinite intelligence, through which men are sometimes forced to undergo all sorts of punishment before discovering their own brains and their own capacity to create useful ideas through imagination. Edition, the world's greatest inventor and scientist, was a tramp telegraph operator. He failed innumerable times before he was driven. Finally, to the discovery of the genius which slept within his brain. <clears throat> Charles Dickens began by pasting labels on blacking pots. The tragedy of his first love penetrated the depths of his soul and converted him into one of the world's true great authors. The tragedy produced first David Copperfield, then a succession of other works that made this a richer and better world for all who read his books. Disappoint, disappointment over love affairs generally had the effect of driving men to drink and women to ruin, and this because most people never learn the art of transmuting their strongest emotions into dreams of a constructive nature. Helen Keller became deaf, dumb, and blind shortly after birth. Despite her greatest misfortune, she has written her name indelibly in the pages of the history of the great. Her entire life has served as evidence that no one ever is defeated until defeat has been accepted as a reality. Robert Burns was an illiterate country lad. He was cursed by poverty and grew up to be a drunkard in the bargain. The world was made better for his having lived because he clothed beautiful thoughts in poetry and thereby plugged a thorn and planted a rose in its place. Brother Booker T. Washington was born in slavery, handicapped by race and color because he was tolerant, had an open mind at all times on all subjects, and was a dreamer. He left his impress for good on an entire race. Beethoven was deaf, Milton was blind, but their names will last as long as time endures because they dreamed and translated their dreams into organized thought. Before passing to the next chapter, a kindle anew in your mind the fire of hope, faith, courage and tolerance. If you have these states of mind and a walking knowledge of the principles described, all else that you need will come to you when you are ready for it. Let immersion state the thought in these words. Every proverb, every book, every byword that belongs to thee for aid and comfort shall surely come home through open or winding passages. Every friend whom not thy fantastic will but the great and tender soul in thee graveth shall lock thee in his embrace. There is a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until he believes he can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not merely hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. A great poet has correctly stated this universal truth through these lines. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening, when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer, he gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. 
I walked for a miles higher, only to learn, dismayed, that any ways I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. See, such a wonderful poem that was. Desire outwits Mother Nature. As a fitting climax to this chapter, I wish to introduce one of the most unusual person I have ever known. I first saw him 24 years ago, a few minutes after he was born. He came into the world without any physical sign of ears, and the doctor admitted, when pressed for an opinion, that the child might be deaf and mute for life. I challenged the doctor's opinion. I had the right to do so. I was the child's father. I, too, reached a decision and rendered an opinion, but I expressed the opinion silently, in the secrecy of my own heart. I decided that my son would hear and speak. Nature could send me a child without ears, but nature could not induce me to accept the reality of the affliction. In my own mind, I knew that my son would hear and speak. How? I was sure there must be a way, and I knew I would find it. I thought of the words of the immortal immersion, the whole course of things goes to teach us faith, we need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. The word, the right word? Desire. More than anything else, I desired that my son should not be a deaf mute. From that desire, I never receded, not for, not for a second. Many years previously, I had written, Our only limitations are those we set up in our own minds. For the first time, I wondered if that statement were true. Lying on the bed in front of me was a newly born child, without the natural equipment of hearing. Even though he might hear and speak, he was obviously disfigured for life. Surely this was a limitation which the child had not set up in his own mind. What could I do about it? Somehow I would find a way to transplant into the child's mind my own born desire for voice and means of conveying sound to his brain without the aid of ears. As soon as the child was old enough to cooperate, I would fill his mind so completely with a bonny desire to hear, that nature would, by methods of her own, translate into it into physical reality. All this thinking took place in my own mind, but I spoke of it to no one every day I renewed the pleas I had made to myself not to accept a deaf mute for a son. As I grew older and began to take notice of things around him, we observed that he had a slight degree of hearing. When he reached the age when children usually begin talking, he made no attempt to speak, but we could tell by his accents that he could hear certain sounds slightly. That was all I wanted to know. I was convinced that if he could hear, even slightly, even he might develop great, still greater hearing capacity. Then something happened which gave me a hope. It came from an entirely unexpected source. We bought a Victrola when the child heard the music for the first time. He went into ecstasies and promptly appropriated the machine. He soon showed a preference for certain records among them. It was a long way to Tipper, Tipperary. On one occasion, he played that piece over and over for almost two hours standing in front of the Victrola with his teeth clamped on the edge of the case. The significance of this self-formed habit of his did not become clear to us until years afterward, for we had never heard of the principle of bone conduction of sound at that time. Shortly after he appropriated the Victrola, I discovered that he could hear me quite clearly when I spoke with my lips touching his mastoid bone or at the base of the brain. These discoveries placed in my possession the necessary media by which I began to translate into reality my burning desire to help my son develop hearing and speech. By the time he was making stabs at speaking certain words, the outlook was far from increasing, but desire backed by faith knows no such word as impossible. Having determined that he could hear the sound of my voice plainly, I began, immediately, to transfer to his mind the desire to hear and speak. I soon discovered that the child enjoyed bedtime stories, so I went to work creating stories designed to develop in himself reliance, imagination, and a keen desire to hear and to be normal. There was one story in particular which I emphasized by giving it some new and dramatic coloring each time it was told. 
It was designed to plant in his mind the thought that his affliction was not a liability, but an asset of great value. Despite the fact that all the philosophy I had imagined clearly indicated that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. I must confess that I had not the slightest idea how this affliction could ever become an asset. However, I continued with, I continued my practice of wrapping that philosophy in bedtime stories, hoping the time would come when he would find some plan by which his handicap could be sure could be made to serve some useful purpose. Reason told me plainly that there was no adequate compensation for the lack of ears and natural hearing equipment. Desire backed by faith pushed reason aside and inspired me to carry on, as I analyzed the experience of retrospect. I can see now that my son's faith in me had much to do with the astounding results. He did not question anything I told him. I sold him the idea that he had a distinct advantage over his older brother and that his advantage would reflect itself in many ways. For example, the teachers in school would observe that he had no ears, and because of this they would show him special attention and treat him with extraordinary kindness. They always did, his mother saw to that, by visiting the teachers and arranging with them to give the child the extra attention necessary. I sold him the idea, too, that when he became old enough to sell newspaper, his older brother had already become a newspaper merchant. He would have a big advantage over his brother, for the reason that people would pay him extra money for his wares, because they could see that he was a bright, industrious boy, despite the fact he had no ears. We could notice that, gradually, the child's hearing was improving. Moreover, he had not the slightest tendency to be self-conscious because of his affliction. When he was about seven, he showed the first evidence that our method of servicing his mind was bearing fruit. For several months, he begged for the privilege of selling newspapers, but his mother would not give her consent. She was afraid that his deafness made it unsafe for him to go on the street alone. Finally, he took matters in his own hands. One afternoon, when he was left at home with the servants, he climbed through the kitchen window. Signed signed to the ground and set out on his own. He borrowed six cents in capital from the neighborhood shoemaker, invested it in papers, sold out, reinvested, and kept repeating until late in the evening. After balancing his accounts and paying back the six cents he had borrowed from his banker, he had a net profit of 42 cents. When he got home that night, we found him in bed asleep, with the money tightly clenched in his hand. His mother opened his hand removed the coins and cried. Of all things, crying over her son's first victory seemed so inappropriate. My reaction was the reverse. I laughed heartily, for I knew that my endeavor to plant in the child's mind an attitude of faith in himself had been successful. His mother saw in his first business venture a little deaf boy who had gone out in the streets and risked his life to earn money. I saw a brave, ambitious, ambitious self-reliant little businessman whose stock in himself had been increased a hundred percent because he had gone into business of his own initiative and had won. The transaction pleased me because I knew that he had given evidence of a trait of resourcefulness that would go with him all through life. Later events proved this to be true. When his older brother wanted something, he would lie down on the floor, kick his feet in the air, cry for it and get it. When the little deaf boy wanted something, he would plan a way to earn the money, then buy it for himself. He is to follow that path. He is to follow that plan. Truly, my son has taught me that handicaps can be converted into stepping stones on which one may climb towards some worthy goal, unless they are accepted as obstacles and used as alibis. The little deaf boy went through the grades, high schools, and colleges without being able to hear his teachers, expecting. Excepting when they shouted loudly at close range, he did not go to a school for the deaf. We would not permit him to learn the sign language. We were determined that he would, that he should live a normal life and associate with normal children. And we stood by that decision, although it cost us many heated debates with school officials. When he was in high school, he tried an electrical hearing aid, but it was of no value to him. Do we believe to a condition that was disclosed when the child was sex? By Dr. J. Gordon Wilson of Chicago when he operated on one side of the boy's head and discovered that there was no sign of natural hearing equipment. 
during its last week in college 18 years after the operation something happened which marked the most important turning point of his life through what seemed to be merry chance he came into possession of another electrical hearing device which was sent to him on trial he was slow about testing it due to his disappointment with a similar device finally he picked the instrument up and more or less carelessly placed it on his head hooked up the battery and lo as if by a stroke of magic his lifelong desire for normal hearing became a reality for the first time in his life he heard practically as well as any person with normal hearing god moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform overjoyed because of the changed world which had been brought to him through his hearing device he rushed to the telephone called his mother and heard her voice perfectly the next day he plainly heard the voices of his professors in class for the first time in his life previously he could hear them only when they shouted at short trains he heard the radio he heard the talking pictures for the first time in his life he could converse freely with other person without the necessity of their having to speak loudly truly he had come into possession of a changed world we had refused to accept nature's error and by persistent desire we had induced nature to correct that error through the only practical means available desire had commenced to pay dividends but the victory was not yet complete the boy still had to find a definite and practical way to convert his handicap into an equivalent asset hardly realizing the significance of what had already been accomplished but intoxicated with the joy of his newly discovered world of sound he wrote a letter to the manufacturer of the hearing aid enthusiastically describing his experience something in his letter something perhaps which was not written on the lines but back of them caused the company to invite him to new york when he arrived he was escorted through the factory and while talking with the chief engineer telling him about his changed world a hunch an idea or an inspiration or an inspiration call it what you wish flashed into his mind it was this impulse of thought which converted his affliction into an asset destined to pay dividends in both money and happiness to thousands for all time to come the sum and substance of that impulse of thought was this it occurred to him that he might be of help to the millions of defined people who go through life without the benefit of hearing devices if he could find a way to tell them the story of his changed world then and there he reached a decision to devote the remainder of his life to rendering useful service to the hard of hearing for an entire month he carried on an intensive research during which he analyzed the entire marketing system of the manufacturer of the hearing device and created ways and means of communicating with the hard of hearing all over the world for the purpose of sharing with them his newly discovered changed world when this was done he put it writing a two year plan based upon his findings when he presented the plan to the company he was instantly given a position for the purpose of carrying out his ambition little did he dream when he went to work that he was destined to bring hope and practical relief to thousands of defiant people who without his help would have been doomed forever to death mutism shortly after he became associated with the manufacturer of his hearing aid he invited me to attend a class conducted by his company for the purpose of teaching deaf mutes to hear and to speak i had never heard of such a form of education therefore i visited the class skeptical but hopeful that my time would not be entirely wasted here i saw a demonstration which gave me a greatly enlarged vision of what i had done to arouse a and give alive in my son's mind the desire for normal hearing as the deaf mutes actually being taught to hear and to speak through application of the self same principle i had used more than 20 years previously in saving my son from deaf mutism thus through some strange turn of the will of fate my son blair and i have been destined to aid in correcting deaf mutism for those as yet unborn because we are the only living human beings as far as i know who have established definitely the fact that deaf mutism can be corrected to the extent to restoring to normal life those who suffer with this affliction it has been done for one it will be done for all these there is no doubt in my mind that blair would have been a deaf mute all his life if his mother and i had not managed to save his mind as we did the doctor who attended at his birth told us confidently the child might never hear or speak 
A few weeks ago, Dr. Irving Voorhees, a noted specialist on such cases, examined Blair very thoroughly. He was astounded when he learned how well my son now hears and speaks and said his examination indicated that theoretically the boy should not be able to hear at all, but the lad does hear, despite the fact that extra pictures show there is no opening in the skull whatsoever from where his ears should be to the brain. When I planted in his mind the desire to hear and talk and live as a normal person, there went with that impulse some strange influence which caused nature to become breeze builder and span the gulf of silence between his brain and the outer world. By some means which the keenest medical specialists have not been able to interpret, it would be sacrilege for me to even conjecture as to now how nature performed this miracle. It would, it would be unforgivable if I neglected to tell the world as much as I know of the humble part I assumed in the strange experience. It is my duty and a privilege to say I believe, and not without reason, that nothing is impossible to the person who backs desire with enduring faith. Verily, a born desire has devious ways of transmuting itself into its practical, into its physical equivalent. Blair desired normal hearing. Now he has it, he was born with a handicap which might easily have sent one with a less defined desire to the street with a bundle of pencils and a tin cup. That handicap now promises to serve as the medium by which he will render useful service to many millions of hard of hearing. Also, to give him useful employment to add adequate financial compensation, the reminder of his life. This little white lies I planted in his mind when he was a child by leading him to believe his, afflic his affliction would become a great asset, which he could capitalize, has justified itself. Verily there is nothing, right or wrong, which belief plus bonding desire cannot make real. These qualities are free to everyone. In all my experience in dealing with men and women who had personal problems, I never handled a single case which more definitely demonstrates the power of desire. Authors sometimes make the mistake of writing of subjects of which they have but superficial or very elementary knowledge. It has been my good fortune to have had the privilege of testing the soundness of the power of desire through the affliction of my own son. Perhaps it was provide providential that the experience came as a day, for surely no one is better prepared than he to serve as an example of what happens when desire is put to the test. If mother nature bends to the will of desire, is it the logical that married men can defeat a bonding desire? Strange and imponderable is the power of the human mind. We do not understand the method by which it uses every circumstance, every individual, every physical thing within its reach as a means of transmuting desire into its physical counterpart. Perhaps science will uncover this secret and plant it in my son's mind the desire to hear and to speak as any normal person hears and speaks. That desire has now become a reality. I planted in his mind the desire to convert his greatest handicap into his greatest asset. That desire has been realized. The modus operandi by which this astounding result was achieved is not hard to describe. It consisted, it consisted of three very definite facts. First, I mixed faith and the desire for normal hearing, which I passed on to my son. Second, I, I communicated my desire to him in every conceivable way available through persistent continuous effort over a period of years. Third, he believed me. As, the, as this chapter was being completed, news came of the death of MME, Suman Hink. One short paragraph in the news dispatch gives the clue to this unusual woman's stupendous success as a singer. I quote the paragraph because the clue it contains is none other than desire. Only in her career, Mimi Suhuman Hink visited the director of the Vienna Court Opera to have him test a voice, but he did not test it. After taking one look at the awkward and poorly dressed girl, he exclaimed, None too gently. With such a face and with no personality at all, how can you ever expect to succeed in opera? My good child, give up the idea. Buy a sewing machine and go to work. You can never be a singer. Never is a long time, the director of the Vienna Court Opera knew much about the technique of singing. He knew little about the power of desire. When it assumes the proportion of an obsession, if he had known more of that power, he would not have made the mistake of condemning genius without giving it an opportunity. Several years ago, one of my business associates became ill. He became worse as time went on. 
and finally was taken to the hospital for, for an operation. Just before he was wheeled into the operating room, I took a look at him and wondered how anyone as thin and emaciated as he could possibly go through a major operation successfully. The doctor warned me that there was little if any chance of my ever seeing him alive again. But that was the doctor's opinion. It was not the opinion of the patient. Just before he was wheeled away, he, whis he whispered feebly, Do not be disturbed, chief. I will be out of here in a few days. The attending nurse looked at me with pity, but the patient did not come through safely. After it was all over, the physician said, nothing but his own desire to live saved him. He never would have pulled through if he had not refused to accept the possibility of death. I believe in the power of desire, backed by faith, because I have seen this power lift men from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which men staged a comeback after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own sons with a normal, happy, successful life, despite nature's having sent him into the world without ears. How can one harness and use the power of desire? This has been answered through this and the subsequent chapters of this book. This message is going out to the world at the end of the longest and perhaps the most devastating depression America has ever known. It is reasonable to presume that the message may come to the attention of many who have been wounded by the depression, those who have lost their fortunes, others who have lost their positions, and great numbers who must recognize, reorganize their plans and stage a comeback. To all, they, to all these I wish to convey the thought that all achievements, no matter what may be its nature or its purpose, must begin with an intense, burning desire for something definite. Through some strange and, and powerful principles of mental chemistry, which she has never divulged, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire that something which recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality as failure. So yeah, that's the end of the chapter 2. Uh, thank you so much for listening. My name is Moin. Uh, you can subscribe my channel Moin Udinso on Facebook as well as you can uh, like my page Moin Udinso so that you can hear so that you can listen to the other podcast as well so if you are if you're not being able to listen to it in the live so what you can do is that you can just download it and then you can listen to it as per your convenience so thank you so much for listening i will come back tonight at 9 p.m for nepali edition of the motivational series okay so till then have a wonderful day ahead happy tiha so enjoy the festival. Bye.